Amen. It's good to be with you and worship with you. Grab a seat. Um, we'll pray into our message in a moment. I just want to make a couple introductory uh, comments. Um, by now, as I'm sure you know, about 10 days ago, a 50-year-old legal uh, standing was overturned in Roe v. Wade. And uh, now abortion rights have been pushed back to the state level. Um, so the, uh, um, it doesn't, it's not a ban on abortion. But what has happened is, is now the states get to decide uh, access to abortion rights. Now, many states had trigger laws put in place that will take effect with varying degrees of speed that will restrict uh, access to abortions. And um, I, in a moment like this, I wanted to reflect on just a couple things uh, as we start. First, I wanted to re reflect on our statement of faith, which includes something um, about the sanctity of life. I'll just read it for you. It says, all human life is sacred and created by God in his image. Human life is of inestimable worth in all its dimensions, including preborn babies, the aged, the physically or mentally challenged, and every other stage or condition from conception through natural death. We are all, therefore, called to defend, protect, and value all human life. And so when something happens that will help defend and protect and value human life, it is uh, a time to be glad. But in, uh, in light of this position that we hold as a church, I just want to offer just a few brief reflections on what has transpired at the Supreme Court level. Now, I do so as me, a white, upper-middle-class, middle-aged man. <laughs> and so there are some things that I will say that are enabled by who I am and limited by who I am. But I want to make some comments nonetheless. I've never faced uh, the reality or even the potential of carrying a human life in my own body. I've never been in a position uh, that many uh, face, facing hardships and stresses that lead people towards choosing to end a pregnancy. I say all this as just a pastor who uh, members often ask me for guidance on how to think in a Christ-shaped way about things that are really important. So I just beg you, uh, just a few moments, just hang with me till the end. See, I think at a time like this, it's a time to remember some things that are important to God. The first is, it's a time to remember the priority God has placed on life. There was a time when life didn't exist. And God, in his infinite wisdom and mercy and kindness, created life where there was once just darkness and void. The churches strove to be people who advocated for the life of children, both born and unborn because they bear the image of God and therefore have infinite and inherent value. And so therefore the church is often related differently to how culture has practiced, how they saw those same lives. When culture around Jesus' time would practice exposure for unwanted pregnancies, uh, leaving uh, children outside the city walls, Christians stood against this practice. Jesus called children to himself and esteemed them as valuable and much of the culture saw children as just property. And so when laws change to protect those young lives, it is a time to be glad. But that is not all we remember this morning. We also need to remember a few other things. First is that God has always prioritized and valued the lives of those on the underside of power. The weak, the vulnerable, the disenfranchised, the poor, the widow, the orphan, the immigrant to the land, and women. And there are ways in which all of those categories of people, those sometimes most under-resourced to care for the life of a, new, uh, of a new child, that burden is placed solely on them. And so as a church, we strive not just to think the right things. We try to do the right things. And so we support organizations like Women's Choice Network that provide services to help mothers choose to see their pregnancy through. We've supported Gregory's Gift that helps fund adoptions. And even just a few weeks ago, me and a bunch of my close friends were down remodeling a kitchen in West Virginia for a foster mom who takes in special needs kids. In your midst, every Sunday, when you sit in these seats, you're around people that have either been adopted or fostered or have been adoptive parents or foster parents. We also need to remember that the church has held many of these core values wildly and consistently. And every priority the church has stood for, you can find instances of compromise. And so again, we as a church strive not to compromise, but I am positive there are ways that we have fallen to live up to the positions we hold as a church. 
And so in light of what is a spotty track record of the church at large, today is also a time to remember grace. Every person that finds salvation finds it by grace. While we were yet sinners, while we were enemies of God, God's gracious, kind, loving nature looked on the life of Jesus instead of our own and spared those who call him Savior and Lord. The leaders of the church and everyone in it has one thing in common. They're sinners saved by grace. And so at a time like this, it's very easy to start thinking about those people. The people that are either pointing their finger at you or the people you are pointing your finger at. See, the reality is when we think of those people, their lives are never as simple as we make them out to be. Decisions like the ones we have in mind this morning are never made lightly. They're made through tears and pain and someone trying to either do their best or do the least wrong thing that they can think of. And so grace reminds us that whoever those people are to you, they find their way into God's kingdom just like you and I, through God's grace. And this issue may not be just some theoretical position you hold. It might have been a lived reality for you. You may have had an abortion. You may have been part of someone else having an abortion. And today is a day to remember grace. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Jesus puts shame to death, and his grace is sufficient to save anyone. And so while there are causes to be glad today, we need to remember all of the things that God has said we need to prioritize because we want to be people who live and love like Jesus. It reminds me of that old hymn, nothing in our hands we bring, simply to thy cross we cling. So as we come empty-handed before the Lord, let's pray and we'll uh, look at God's scripture in a moment together. God, we are grateful for your sovereign hand in history. And Lord, we want to be people who stand up for what you stand up for. We want to be people who reflect the character and life of Jesus Christ. As we later in the service will take communion, we'll be acutely reminded that we don't do that. We often fall short. We hold our positions inconsistently. And we often don't show the same grace to others that we have been given ourselves. God, make us more like your son. That's what we ask. Use how we'll look at your scripture this morning to shape our lives around the shape of the life of Jesus. We ask that in the name of his, name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. In the mode of super abrupt transitions, let's look at the scriptures. <laughs> So I'm excited to continue on in our series in the Psalms. We'll be looking at the Psalms this summer with the goal in mind of informing how we pray. So as we've looked at Psalms over the past number of weeks, we've looked at reflecting about God's great character and works and history. We've looked about rejoicing in who God is. And we've last week looked at what it looks like to be a someone who repents. And this week, as we look at Psalms 42 and 43 that go together, actually we'll just look at a couple verses from 42, we'll learn about how to remorse. Now, technically, if you looked these up in a commentary, you wouldn't find the word remorse. You'd find the word lament as, as the category of Psalms, but lament doesn't start with an R. I wanted everything to start with an R, so I just sothorced everything, okay? So in the laments, you'll find the psalmist being remorseful, lamenting some things, some of the categories. He'll lament his own heart or actions, his wrongdoings and his own failures. You'll see him lamenting the injustice of the world or the actions of others. You'll see him actually even lamenting God's actions or even God's inactions. God doing something that he didn't agree with or not doing something that he wanted him to do. And when the psalmist laments, he tends to be quite honest. He is in a place of darkness and despair and he is talking to God, doing the best he can to be honest about where he is. So I hope you find some comfort in knowing that there's no sin disclosed in these psalms. This is just someone following God throughout their whole days, reaching a sort of a dip in his own spirituality and crying out to a God that he's not even convinced is there when he calls. So we're going to look at an honest psalm and we're going to learn to do two things. that we find When we find ourselves in that own kind of dark night of the soul, that we'll do these two things. We will pour and we will put. There's two things we've got to remember. How hard could it be, right? We're going to pour and we're going to put. We'll find ourselves in Psalm 42, which begins with this introductory comment. It reads like this. 
It says, for the director of music, a mascal of the sons of Korah. So we are being oriented to what kind of psalm this is. You see that at the beginning of many of the psalms, they'll give some introductory comment about who they're to or what it's supposed to be. So we see that this is either for or to the director of music. And we get another hint from the sons of Korah. The sons of Korah were the priestly category of person that were charged with leading worship in the temple. Now, where this was written, they are cut off from the temple. They're far away from it geographically, and they can't get back into that place of presence where they would have this role in leading the people of Israel in worship. And so this letter might be written to them to kind of comfort them in their faraway place. And what it is, it's a mascal, which if it isn't self-explanatory, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, it's not. A mascal is a wise teaching or song. So this is advice. This is teaching. This is wisdom on how to navigate through this dark night of the soul where you feel far from the presence of God. But it continues also with the psalmist's first words, orienting us to the state that he's in. Look at verse 1 with me. It says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. Now, I have realized several times during the series that when I go to picture a psalm, I don't always picture it correctly. I sometimes have in mind something much more rosy that's going on. Take, for example, this one. This sounds like to me, at least before this past week when I studied it, as kind of an idyllic scene. And I'm picturing sort of like a Bambi-type setting where a deer was just frolicking through the woods, you know, and it's like hanging out with its like buddies and they're, I don't know, they're playing it tag or just enjoying, you know, nature. And after running around for a while and playing, you know, uh, games together, they get a little thirsty. So they just find this, this near accessible, beautiful stream and they just drink till their heart's content. You know, they're giving high hooves to each other on, you know, what a great game they did. They're maybe even chest bumping or whatever deers do, um, And uh, that's the kind of scene that I've pictured in my mind. Now, knowing that that's how I picture everything gives you an insight into how easy my life has been, right? But the reality is many commentators agree that this is not a rosy picture. This isn't a deer who's just gone for a nice jog through the woods and needs, you know, a little splash of Gatorade. This is a deer that is so thirsty that it feels like it's dying. But it remembers the location of one stream that it has drunk from before, and it goes back, and that stream has run dry. This is not a scene that is happy. This is a scene of desperation, of a deer panting. Deer don't see how long they can go without drinking just to see. Deer drink when they're thirsty. Whenever there's water, they give themselves the water they need. They only get thirsty if there's no water to be found. This deer is going back to the place where it knew it found streams of living water before, and they have dried up. There is nothing there to slake their thirst. And so the psalmist is trying to paint a picture for us in which he is the thirsty deer that can't find water, and the water that he can't find is God. It gets even clearer in verse 2. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? You see, he's saying, my soul thirsts for God. He's the deer. God is the water that he can't find. And this isn't a superficial thirst. This isn't, oh, my throat's a little dry or my lips are chapped. He is saying, all the way down to my soul, am I thirsty for the living God? He feels like on a spiritual level, he is about to die. And he cannot find where it went. This condition is not unique to the psalmist. It's so prevalent in the life of Christians that they have names for it. It goes by the name spiritual dryness or spiritual disorientation, a spiritual night or the dark night of the soul. We've talked about the dark night of the soul. I don't expect you to remember it, but the dark night of the soul is this this period of time that not new Christians go through usually. It's seasoned, mature people that have been following Christ for a while when they just feel like God has left the building and they don't know where to find him. It's not necessarily a a punishment for sin. It's just part of the seasonality of the life of faith. It's a state in which you find yourself destabilized, disoriented, disillusioned, deserted, and in a dark place. This theme of darkness is as old as creation itself. God had to enter into the darkness to bring light 
in the earliest accounts of creation. There are scores of biblical examples of people being in just this state. Job was convinced that God had abandoned him when he went through his hardship and trials. The Psalms are littered with examples of the psalmist feeling like God has left the building. The Israelites that were enslaved in Egypt weathered 430 years of God's silence. For seven decades of exile, they felt spiritual darkness. Jonah was literally entombed in darkness and physical darkness for three days, only to emerge into the spiritual darkness of having people not receive his message. All of the prophets can fall in that category as well. And even Mary and Martha, when they cried out to Jesus to hurry, to come and save the life of their brother Lazarus, but but Jesus uh, took his time and Lazarus died. They experienced darkness. Many examples of Christians going through this exist outside the Bible. John of the Cross, a 16th century Christian who was held in captivity and tortured while he was there in his mind, literally wrote the book called The Dark Night of the Soul. C.S. Lewis experienced a dark night of the soul when his wife Joy painfully died from bone cancer. He writes about this sense of spiritual abandonment and a grief observed in which he calls God a cosmic sadist, someone who is unreasonable, someone who's vain, vindictive, unjust, and cruel. It's not exactly words that you'd associate with C.S. Lewis, are they? (laughs) Someone like Oswald Chambers has written about this state. Even Mother Teresa, for the last 50 years of her ministry to the poor and the sick and dying in India, writes this, that she experienced for the last 50 years of her ministry, a profound interior suffering, a lack of sensible consolation, spiritual dryness, an apparent absence of God from her life, and at the same time, a painful longing for him. Eugene Peterson says that the absence of God was a common experience in the company of the saved. But the reality is it's not even just isolated to the saved. The Savior experienced this as well. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane has said that his soul was so overwhelmed with sorrow that he was at the point of death. He was sweating tears of blood. And on the cross, what did he say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Spiritual dryness, the dark night of the soul, finds its way into the life of every Christian. And we find ourselves smack dab in the middle of a psalm in which the psalmist is experiencing that. But he will turn the corner soon to help us through. So if you find yourself in just such a state, where you're wondering, not on a philosophical level, but at a real kind of felt experience level, is God there? Does God see me? You're in good company. And listen to the words of the psalmist as he will turn the corner towards a solution. But he's not done setting us up to his state yet. In verse 3, he says, My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, Where is your God? There's some kind of cruel irony when somebody else asks you the very question or doubt that you're experiencing. He's not worried about God from a philosophical level. Are you there? He is questioning from a place of belief. I believe in God, but I don't feel his presence. And then those around him come up to him and say, yeah, where is your God? There's something exceptionally cruel when you get asked the same question that you are struggling through. And so he's in a bad state. He is in the dark night of the soul. How does he get through? Verse 4. He says, These things I remember as I pour out my soul to God. As I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. You can hear in this description that he's longing back to the days where he could go to the temple among all the people and lift his hands and shout with joy to worship God, but he's not in that place. But he begins to lead us towards the solution. The first thing that the psalmist does is he pours out his soul. What does it look like to pour out your soul to God? I think we'll find as we see his example that pouring out your soul involves asking unfiltered, honest questions to God. See, In these prayers, in these kinds of remorses, in these kinds of laments, you don't see a lot of self-editing. Now, I don't know if you get to pray in public a lot, but like I am the go-to guy for that, right? I like to have seasons where I'm like just a civilian and off the clock. They don't exist, right? 
I go to a family function and I'm always the guy praying. With the one exception, at my dinner table, my seven-year-old Micah always steals the show. So I'm kind of a little like mad at him for it. He's not here, so I can say that. But what happens when you go to pray in public is you, it's not as honest maybe. It's not as free form. It's not just what occurs to you. You kind of think about it, right? You want it to sound like legit, like you're a guy who knows how to pray. And so you pray in a way that sounds good. This is not that kind of prayer. See, the reality is, I think it's so important that God values our honesty in prayer, and it's worthwhile for us to practice that, that we don't put on a show for God. But the reality is, even in your private prayers, my hunch is, if you're anything like me, that you've edited yourself. You've thought stuff about the way God is or what God's up to and kind of been like, God, really? Like you failed to act when I needed you to act. You do stuff I don't like. You don't do stuff I wish you would do. I don't get why you think this way. I don't get why you have these priorities. Are you even there? But you can't ask that stuff to God, right? You might think it, but you don't pray it, right? The reality is, in the Psalms of Lament, there is no self-editing. There are no rules of what he can and cannot say to God. And I think they are prescriptive for how you and I ought to pray. If you look at the Psalms at large, all 150 of them, you'll find questions like these. Why? How come? How long? That's not fair. Are you there? What were you thinking? Where are you and when are you going to stop that? Jesus always had more trouble with hypocrites, those who weren't honest, than sinners who were bad but just honest about who they were. And so in the Psalms, we see question after question that kind of seem shocking that you would ask God. Just in this Psalm, if we had time to go over every single verse in Psalm 42 and 43, which are taken as one unit, listen to the questions you'd hear. When can I go and meet with God? Where can I go and meet with God? Why am I downcast? Why am I disturbed? Why have you forgotten me? Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about mourning? These are not a list of nicely edited, sanctimonious prayers and questions. This is the psalmist saying, I'm in a bad way, and you're going to hear about it. And this is not a sinful psalm. This is kind of prescriptive. This is how the psalmist, I think, is encouraging us to pray. We are to pour out our soul by asking honest, unfiltered questions to God. But we need not stop there. We shouldn't stop there. We also need to ask honest, unfiltered questions to ourselves. Listen to verse 5. He says, why my soul are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. He is asking himself questions. I won't quote it at length, but a few weeks ago, I referred to a passage in one of my favorite books called Spiritual Depression. Yes, that's the title, one of my favorite books. And in which the author, Dr. David Martin Lloyd-Jones, writes about just this psalm. And he says, you know, we are all always talking to ourselves And that's actually part of the problem. Do you ever talk to yourself? How many people talk to themselves out loud ever? Okay, sweet. I just want to see if anybody raised their hands. I've taken copious notes. We've taken a screenshot. You're all weirdos, okay? No, I I do that all the time too. But by and large, it's, it's in my head. And sometimes there's this tape playing. And on a good day, it is awesome. Adam, you're the best. You're great. It's wonderful. But 98% of the other days, it's often a little critical. That tape in my head is sometimes saying, like, did you really just say that? Or, like, you thought that joke would land in your sermon? Joke's on you, right? Did you really say that? I can't believe you even thought that. Everyone's going to notice. They're going to think you're stupid. They're going to think you're a fraud. They don't really like you. And they're going to find out who you really are. Do you ever have that kind of tape playing in your head? It's fine. It's natural. The problem is, is when you believe it. See, one of my favorite quotes I came across in one of my years of schooling was this. Don't believe everything you think. We live in a day and age where if you find it in here in your head or in here in your heart, you kind of trust that it must be true. And so you might think monstrous thoughts about who you are and the kind of life God's given you. And because you found them in here, they must be true. Or you might have feelings or longings or desires that you find in your heart. And you think, hey, if it's in here, I got to go with it. But the reality is the Christian tradition has a long history of questioning ourselves, even down to those things we feel like are native and true about ourselves. 
And so the psalmist here is falling in that line and asking his soul some questions. Dr. Dave Martin Lauren Jones says, don't just listen to yourself, talk to yourself. He paints this picture of grabbing yourself by the lapels and shaking yourself and staring yourself in the eyes and saying, why are you just believing everything you think? Sometimes pouring out your soul to God looks like asking him questions, but sometimes it looks like asking yourself questions. Why do you believe that about yourself? So the psalmist, as he is navigating his way through this dark night in the soul, he begins to pour out his soul to God. But the second thing he does is he puts his hope in God. Last section of that verse again says, put your hope in God. This is him talking to himself. Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him. Maybe he can't yet. Maybe he can't in the present, but he will. I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. So I want to talk just briefly about what it looks like to put our hope in God. Now, the reality is this has a whole bunch of different facets to it. So I'm going to throw a a lot at you. Catch what you can, okay? So as we think about putting our hope in God, we see that first off, it starts with this resolution. For I will yet praise him. He almost feels like he can't in that moment, but he commits to a course of action. It's this deciding in advance the person he wants to be. He may not be the kind of person that feels like, I want to worship God right in this moment. But he says, I'm gonna. I will get there. I will get out of this dark night in the soul. Putting his hope starts with a resolution. So though he feels destabilized and disoriented and disillusioned and deserted and in a dark place and just plain down, he says, I will yet Praise him. Reminds me of the words of Job when he was in his dark night of the soul. And he says, though he slay me, yet I will praise him. That is what it looks like to put your hope in God. Second, putting your hope in God looks like trusting. All throughout the Old Testament, when the people of God are hoping in God, it really looks like they are just trusting that God will come through. Hoping also sometimes looks like waiting. See, another equally good translation of this verse, it says, put your hope in God. If you looked up the NASB translation, you know what it reads? You don't actually even see the word hope because the word hope can also be translated as wait. So it would say something like, wait for God instead of put your hope in God. Sometimes hoping simply looks like waiting, enduring, weathering, showing grit and perseverance, and sometimes even suffering through a hardship. That is sometimes what hope looks like. So hope is trusting. Hope is waiting. Hope is resolving. Hope is also looking past now. So often, hope has to contradict your real life experience. Because if you are hoping in a dark time for things you don't yet see or don't yet seem real, you have to contradict the present. You are looking forward to that time when God will make good on his promises. So also, hoping looks like claiming those promises. Hoping is saying, I will have righteousness in place of my sin. Hoping looks like I will have life in place of death. Hoping says, I'll have glory in place of my suffering. I'll have peace in place of my dissension. And I will have full acceptance in God in place of where I feel shame. Hope looks like contradicting the present reality that often bums us out and puts us in that dark, dark place. There will be one day where all those wrongs are made right. Jürgen Moltmann, a great theologian, says that hope really is not just a consolation in your suffering. It's a divine promise against your suffering that one day God will wipe all te- tears from every eye. But we're not done. Hope also looks like present engagement with the world. Hope isn't something that you just say, one day God will get these things right and I get a pass on now. Hope is always a radical call to action and engagement with this world here and now. And that is because hope engages where God's victories will be. Those who hope strain against evil because they know it loses in the end. Hope Maybe my favorite description of hope comes from Soren Kierkegaard, so I know everybody's does, but mine too. 
True hope is a passion for the possible. It makes me think of the words of Paul when he says, you know, I am more than a conqueror. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. What God has made possible in Christ is incredible. He kind of made the impossible possible. And so hope, because of what we have in Christ, is a passion for the possible. God has called us to be people of hope. Because see, hopelessness can creep in. But hopelessness doesn't always make a big show. Sometimes hopelessness isn't all that demonstrative. It can look like things like resignation or melancholy. Hopelessness can look like weakness or timidity or weariness or not wanting to be what God requires us to be. It can look like folding under pressure. It can look like not really trying. Lack of hope need not look desperate. Lack of hope can look like boredom or resignation or going with the flow or making big decisions with a shrug of the shoulders. Hopelessness, more often than not, looks like our sins of omission than our sins of commission. In a moment, we're going to celebrate communion. And we'll ask God to forgive us for both those things we've done, sins of commission, and the things we've left undone, our sins of omission. Having a long list of things that we know we ought to do that we don't is a sign that hopelessness is creeping in to our lives. And so because of that, maybe one last thing that hope is, is that it looks like remembering. Last verse we'll look at together. Verse 6 says, my soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. See, all of those geographical places we could hack into, but let me give you the Cliff's Notes version. The psalmist is saying, I am far from God. I used to be the guy leading the charge in the temple, and now I'm in a faraway place. As likely this psalm may have been written during exile when they were literally cut off from the temple in the place of God's presence. And he's longing back, trying to remember what it was like to be flooded with the felt sense of God's presence. And so in his place, from a position of hope, he says, I will remember you. And when we think about remembering In the Bible, remembering is not always just calling a fact to mind. Remembering is always a call to action. Gerald Wilson writes this. He says, when Israel is called to remember Yahweh, which it often is, it's in order to remain faithful. Israel is called to remember the commandments. Why? In order to keep them. She is asked to remember Yahweh's wonderful acts so that she can give praise for them. And she is asked to remember how Yahweh delivered her in spite of her lack of righteousness so that she can be humbly dependent on him. Memory ought never be passive, but active. To remember God is to ground one's life in him and to draw one's life's decisions and actions from a place of remembering God and his character. The call to put our hope in God is that big, taking action and remembering and moving towards the things that matter to God. So this morning, we've seen a psalm in which the psalmist is in the dark night of the soul. This isn't an inexperienced Christian. This is someone who's a seasoned vet, and they feel far away from God. And so if you find yourself in that position this morning, take heart, take comfort, take courage to do the things that the psalmist said to pour out your soul to God, ask honest questions, and to put your hope in him. Resolve to praise him one day. Maybe you can't this morning, but resolve that you will. Remember God's presence and his character and then act in accordance with it. When you put your hope in God, you will have a passion for what God has made possible. And so now, let us turn towards remembering what God has done on our behalf. Let's act in hope here together as we celebrate communion, looking back on what Jesus did to free us up so that we can live to be lights in his world. Will you pray with me? Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, 
word and deed. We let hopelessness creep in. We let forgetfulness creep into our lives. And we do that both by our sins of commission, what we've done, but also by our sins of omission, what we leave undone. We've not loved you with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, and we haven't loved our neighbors as ourselves. God, for these things, we're truly sorry, but more, we humbly repent. We want to live lives that are different. We want to pour out our souls to you. We want to put our hope in you so that you cause us to act in ways that make us live in love like Jesus. So for his sake, your son Jesus, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways and remember you always, putting our hope in you. To the glory of your name, amen.